On today's episode of Among the Clouds, I'm talking to Corey Osborne from the bands Life Wheels and Panda Riot. You might also know him from his work with Ariel and Tom Spacey. Not only is Corey an amazing musician and songwriter, he's also been a staple of the Chicago shoegaze scene for over 20 years. Stay tuned. Hey, Corey, thanks for uh, joining me. Thanks for doing the show. I appreciate it. Oh, man, I'm honored. This is super cool. You were actually one of the first people I asked when I was uh, thinking about, you know, doing this. And I put some feelers out there. And I figured if I ask enough people and they say, yeah, I'll I'll do that, then I kind of have to do it. (laughs) So because I'd been putting it off for like over a year or so and talking myself out of it. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to ask like 10, 15 people. And if, you know, even half say, yeah, I'll do it. I'm like, well, shit, now I'm going to have to do it. So you were one of the uh, people who said, yeah, I'll do it. Um, and I put you on the list. It's it's a really great list. I mean, you've, you've I mean, I've been following you since you started and, and yeah, you've had some really cool people on and, you know, so yeah, I'm, I'm stoked for sure. Obviously I'm the best you're watching it to see me. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, I just kind (laughs) of want to see how those other people respond to you and your awesomeness. You know what I mean? Like everybody does, you know, I'm I'm hoping I can, I can keep my shit together. You know what I mean? Like, um, all right. So real fast, uh, let's talk a little bit of our history together. Um, I first discovered, I don't know how many bands in for you, but Tom Spacey, um, I don't even remember where I got the CD from. But I know I've had it since probably late '90s. I'm thinking. When did it come out? Oh, uh, I think it. Jeez. Oh, um, I think it was '98. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, that seems about right. '98, probably. And so I would say I had it '98, maybe '99, because when Whimsical first started playing shows with Ariel, right? Yeah, um, right. You were playing in the live version of the band. Yeah. And I didn't know you were from Tom Spacey at the time. Okay. And so I know when I found out you you and then the other guitarist were both from Tom Spacey. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Adam. So yeah. And so when I discovered that, I remember I'd already been listening had this C D for a year or two at that time. So what year at least two, three years at that time. So what year sure. were you did you start playing with Ariel? Man, uh probably I want to say probably it was probably around 2003. Uh, And I think I, you know, I think I was in Ariel until about 2007. So if it was 2003, I remember at the time, like Tom Spacey seemed, and I don't mean this like old, but I'd I'd already had the CD for years. You know what I mean? So it was like, oh shit, those guys were in Tom Spacey. Because at that time, the internet was so like nothing that there was no information. I knew the CD said something about Chicago in it, but I didn't know anybody who knew you guys. I didn't know anything about you guys. Um, so it was like, oh shit, those guys were from uh, Tom Spacey. Um, and I'm trying to remember how I even found the CD. At that probably, time, you just- Probably in a used bin, you know, maybe in a gas station for a buck or something like that. Probably, probably you know. yeah. Speedway. No, I, <laughs> I mean, at that time, you would, I would go up to Chicago for shows or whatever, and we'd always run to- uh, a couple of record stores while we were out there and you would just kind of thumb through whatever. And I think I just saw the cover. And at that time it had Spacey in the name and it had like sort of watery blue something. And you're just like, it was, it. yeah, it was, it was you know? really on the nose. It was super, <laughs> super duper on the nose. We weren't very subtle about what we were trying to accomplish with the band, obviously. So, <laughs> but it was cool because it might be on the nose, but it was enough for me to you know, at that time, if you saw a cover that you liked or whatever, you would just buy it. And like, fuck it, I'll take a chance. You oh know yeah, what I mean? yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, yeah I, so I that, definitely that, got burned. I got, I, I got burned on some things like that. But yeah, that was always kind of the thing, right? Like you would go to, um, you would go to a store. You know, it might be a Tower, it might be a Rose Records or something like that. Um, and it was always dope if you went someplace that had good imports, right? Because that mm-hmm. was when you were getting the really cool. That's you know, obviously when we're, you're talking about finding like a Swerve Driver CD or like, a, you know, like a Slow Dive kind of scenario or, or you know, just import versions of, uh, you know, albums that were, were released within the U.S. but with uh, other tracks. 
So you were really lucky if you found a place that had a station that would let you play a CD and listen to it. Oh, but yeah, 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 yeah. I always kind of, I always like that kind of the just luck of the draw, hope, you know, like this seems cool. Like, you know, and, uh, you right. know, usually I, 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 I think I hit more than I missed, you know, usually. So, yeah, I think, I think we all did, but also at that time, if you spent money on it, you're like, I'm going to listen to this damn thing yeah. until, until I, yeah. I mean, you really had to give it a shot. It wasn't like now where you listen to 30 seconds and you're like, Nope. <laughs> and you just, yeah. Skip, yeah. you know what I mean? So, sure. the, but that was part of the thrill was, you know, the chance, you know, yeah, of, sure. is it going to work out? And then as far as Tom Spacey goes, and I know you've seen me post this because somebody on Facebook at one point asked for bands that sounded like early Verve and I posted Tom Spacey and then there was some people on there like, oh shit, this is like you write what I'm looking for, you know? And yeah. um, it's not like you guys were like identical clones of Verve because actually nobody could actually do that. But right. it was the first, especially the first like two songs, two, three songs on the sure. CD where I was like, okay, I know where these guys were coming from. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, I mean, um, Verve was, I mean, you, you, you nailed it. They were a massive, massive influence. Um, I remember so the first time I heard Verb was just kind of random. Um, I was working at Crown Books and uh, this manager who I didn't even like, I, this guy was just kind of a square dude, but he had the Sliver soundtrack, that Sharon Stone, I think it's Daniel Baldwin movie and um, Star Sale is on that. It's on the soundtrack. And uh, so, you know, the rest of the soundtrack was garbage. I don't know why I was listening to it or if it was just on in the back. Uh, and then uh, Star Sail came on and man, I mean, it just, it rocked me to the core. I was just like, holy shit. You know, like this is, you know, y y you have those moments where you, you hear stuff and you're just like, you know, these guys, whatever they're doing, you know, it's just, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. So, <laughs> I mean, but... Spacey, Spacey was mm, maybe my second real serious band. Um and uh, so, you know, you're still trying to figure out your sound and, and what to do. So, yeah, we definitely wore that influence on our sleeves. Um, it, but, uh, yeah, I mean, God, yeah, the Verve, yeah, definitely. I'll swear up and down about Verve. When they became the Verve is right. when I, st you know, I still like a handful of songs on, uh, what is it, a Northern uh, Soul? Is that what yeah. it is? Yeah, no, and I like a, few, a Northern Soul. It was it was different, right? Like you're kind of like, oh, you know, they're they're almost going kind of a new decade is almost like arena rock, right? Like it comes in, it comes in pretty heavy. Um, but man, I mean, that that's just uh, I don't know. In in some ways, to me, that's it's almost like them kind of hitting the, a, a pinnacle moment where they're really claiming that like kind of spot. You know, it's during kind of the swell of, of Brit pop and Oasis and all that stuff is going on, and they're they're really kind of staking their claim. And then uh, it just kind of seemed like after that, Ashcroft kind of started maybe playing a little bit too much of an oversized role in the writing. And right. uh, you know, that's where you get into, you know, kind of the pop aspect of it. And and there's people who I know like uh, you know, Urban Hymns is probably, you know, on a lot of people's maybe top 10, you know, um, and you know, there's it's a good pop album, but I mean, I think there's three songs on each of those two albums that I are like um come on and yeah whatever the last song is on both albums is sure. amazing yeah, yeah um it took a while for me to get into northern hymns i'm not northern hymns northern northern no, northern, soul. northern soul it took yeah. me a while because i thought i was getting you know um the storm in heaven part two yeah yeah and yeah. it's just so dry so you know and i was like uh what is this you know but i will say out of my top five guitarists ever nick mccabe is in the top five you think about the the south pacific um and obviously like you know man just where the geese where the geese go um basically the entire um god uh storm in heaven you know what i mean like he he i mean jesus the what he was doing and and you know uh simon and, and you know just everything they, they were All just so yeah it, I mean, and 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 Ashcroft too. I mean, was the perfect frontman for it. I mean, that, that man, that that would those albums and EPs were just. I mean, I I can't emphasize enough how much time I spent just driving around smoking, uh, and and just you know absorbing it. You know what I mean? Uh, so it right. definitely, yeah, it definitely became kind of part of my uh, my DNA for it, writing uh, in the '90s for sure. You know, so. At the time you're in Ariel, we played a couple shows together. 
um, then whimsical ends up stopping um, for 10 years or whatever. And then we get back together, just Chrissy and I in somewhere 2015 or so, whatever. But we ended up doing two sort of reunion shows and we played with you um, both times at Callum Shoegazer and then your own fest, Crash Pop yeah. Festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, I remember. So it was good to see you, you guys, you know, and you've been doing it this whole time. I took like a 10, 11 year break while I was doing other bands. Yeah, so, I mean, we've, we're not like best friends or anything, but we've known each other, you know. We're, we're, we're cool, dude. <laughs> we're, we're shoegaze dads, right? You know, I mean, it's just, the only reason I, I think we're probably not, you know, like, you know, a little bit more tight is just, you know, you're in Florida, man. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard to get together. You know right. what I mean? But I, I, you know, I've always, I don't know, man, I've always gotten a kick out of just uh, kind of seeing your posts and, and, and you, you are one of my, uh, one of my favorite kind of smart ass dudes. Like, I just <laughs> think you've always got a really good quip handy and uh i i got a lot of respect for that so you know what i mean like you know I, you know it's it's it i i you know like i said i i i'm st you know just really kind of uh glad to know everybody um that i've gotten to meet through music and and through our scene you know um but uh you know as you know man the bands the musicians and then the really there's like kind of this kind of core group of fans uh renee kutle uh jay Rowe, you know mark dooley all those guys who and gals who, you know, really represent and show up to shows and travel and, and come around and do all that stuff. And that's, I think that's, I think one of the best things about doing all this, you know? Yeah. And we're always happy to see everybody. Yeah. Um, so uh, what came first, becoming a musician or hearing shoegaze, dream pop? And I say this in all my videos, when I say sure. shoegaze and dream pop, it's dreamy stuff. My definition yeah. is way different than everybody yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. You know, what came first? for you um well it's it's kind of a that's an interesting question because i've always had music um my parents you know had instruments all over the house my sister and i used to mess around uh bang around on the piano you know play the guitar whatever we could find uh laying around the house uh and you know i did like concert band and stuff like that in junior high um but i you know i wasn't I mean, I was always kind of into music, but I was not into a scene per se for a long time. I uh, seventh grade, I was listening to Glenn Miller and big bands, and then I went through it like an almost an exclusively just Beatles phase, and then I went straight into just Metallica phase, which was weird. Uh, that was right about when uh, "And Justice for All" came out. Mm -hmm. um, th the reason I started really kind of playing seriously, um, it, it's so stupid. There were these two dudes at my high school who. Um, man, they were just kind of like these mod guys, right? And uh, I just really dug their style. Um, and uh, they always hung out with these really cool, you know, the art school girls and all that kind of stuff. And I was kind of like a, I was like a really kind of a weak ass jock kind of guy at the time. I was playing sports and doing all that stuff. Um, and a mutual friend was like, hey man, those guys are gonna start a band. And I was like, cool, I'll play drums. And they're like, no, Jeff is playing drums, man. And I'm like, well, I guess I've got a bass at the house. My dad plays bass. Uh, he's a better bass player than I am um and uh that's basically what how it started i i when i i couldn't pick a bass line out of a song dude um <laughs> i was i was pretty awful at first that band sucked but like um you know that first time when you're playing with a, a you know a group of people and we maybe had like a 30 second 40 second stretch where everything synced and you know you get that feeling where you're just like in lockstep with everybody and that pretty much ruined my life uh that moment pretty, yeah. that first time there's a rush there yeah yeah you just you don't get it anywhere else and and uh so i started taking lessons and got better um and then it, it was interesting i was in a band that didn't have a guitar player so i kind of had to learn how to do chords and kind of fill in those spaces um and so i was just kind of doing stuff like that and i had a buddy who uh rick who who used to basically just go to record stores and just rob them blind and then he would make these he would make these like mixtapes or compilations uh for everybody so he started me off with like chapter house and with like um slow dive and uh you know it, you know and 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 it just kind of so that's when I started hearing that stuff but you know at the time it was still like alternative right so I was listening to that right. but I was still you know also to In Spiral Carpets and Happy Mondays and all that kind of stuff um it's funny actually the first time I heard My Bloody Valentine 
um, that the drummer from that band uh, met this girl at the mall. She worked at, you know, some clothing store. And uh, so she lent him the tremolo EP and he left it in his car and it worked. Uh, it got so fucking bent. And uh, so we're like, shit, what are we going to do? Because they broke up and she wanted the record back. <laughs> And I'm like, dude, I, I've got all these heavy books and yearbooks and stuff, and we'll just sit it under there for a couple of days and hopefully it'll flatten out. And it did. It, it flattened out, right? So we're like, fuck yeah, we're so smart. So we we put it on the record player and hadn't listened to it before. And, you know, it's the fucking triple EP. So it's, you know, to hear knows when. And, and you know, just, and I, I was like, oh, fuck, it's still fucked up. You know what I mean? I thought, it was, I thought the record was like totally screwed. Um, and it wasn't until I heard the Glider EP on cassette that I was like, oh, they're doing that on purpose. It's supposed to sound like that, you know, and that was another <laughs> one of those kind of aha, like, holy shit kind of moments where, you know, I mean, everybody's got their, their, you know, my bloody Valentine story where you're like, oh man, you know, that just, you know, expanded my, you know, blew my mind and expanded my horizons and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. yeah. So definitely, yeah, definitely just kind of playing around and screwing around and then just kind of fell into it. And then, uh found shoegaze and, and or you know dreamy stuff and kind of was lucky enough to be doing it when it was kind of you know kind of the first wave kind of just post those you know first few bands coming out so it was kind of cool to to exist in that space my first proto shoegaze band from 91 to 95 we were still like trying to get signed you know to be part of the first that first wave you yeah. know what i mean yeah, and, yeah uh but we were in high school and stuff like that anyway so when did you start singing so the that band before spacey shift i did some background vocals and um i've always kind of um you know just enjoyed you know, if, if you've ever hung out with me, you know, I, I'm always kind of busting out into like impromptu just joke songs and stuff like that. Um, it, I never really thought of myself as a, a particularly good singer. Um, but uh, basically when Spacey kind of, you know, kind of took off, you know, Adam and I split the duties there. Um, and it's I've always found singing to be just like super hard. And, you know, I try to, I try to keep my bass parts interesting and, 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 you know, not necessarily technical all the time, but the more, the more shit I throw into a bass line, the harder it is to sing too. So um, that was, that was always kind of the trick was to kind of try to find a space where it's like, oh, okay, I'm doing something relatively in the pocket and, you know, kind of singing along, you know, with that. But I, I think Spacey was probably the first band where I really got up and, and, and sing a lot, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I still think it's, it's hard, you know, I, I sing a little bit on some of the newer light foil stuff and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely something that you, you want to try to keep up and keep in practice. I hadn't done it in a long time and I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I felt that. Uh, it's funny because a lot of singers would say they're not the greatest singers in the world. I can't sing at all and I've been forced to many times, but I can't sing uh -huh. at all. But, but I always know it's you when I hear you, which whether or not you're uh, the male Celine Dion is oh, besides man. the fact, but I always know it's you, you know what I mean? Like I, every time I, I hear a song with you, I'm like, okay, well that's, that's Corey. So, I mean, there's something to be said for that. It's, it's interesting. I've had a, a few people um, tell me that they like my voice a lot, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I think it's probably that true for most people. When you hear your own voice, you're just like, oh, dude, I sound like that. You know what I mean? Like, and, right. uh, you know, so I, I get a kick out of it because it's kind of like, you know, I don't know if I would, you know, if I, if I heard myself, somebody who sounded like me, if I'd be like, oh my God, you know what I mean? Like if I'd be into it, but like, um, it is, it is nice that, you know, when you're up there that, that people identify with that and, and dig it, you know what I mean? Like that's, it's, mm -hmm. it's humbling and it's, you know look man we're not getting a lot of money i i don't know like you man but uh you i'm know, not I, getting I'm any not money a ton of money in this business and, uh, <laughs> you know so you know a lot of a lot of what you go off of is is feedback and and you know and and good response and people just being into it you know that's what drives you or what sure. drives me anyway and uh you know so yeah i always i always get a kick out of that it, it it's nice to know that i have a unique voice i guess you know what i mean like that's i guess it's cool you know like i, I I'm happy about that. I know? mean, I'm jealous. I can't sing at all. Oh, so. man. Oh, <laughs> um, thank you, man. Thank you. That's 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 nice. I feel I feel I good mean, right now. I feel all fuzzy. You really should because yeah. I mean I think about it probably on a daily basis. Like, dude, if I could only sing, I'd have so much more stuff done. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, but 
You're like Chrissy. I wouldn't have to deal with her anymore. <laughs> well, no, no, I don't mean it like that. I'm joking. But, no, Chrissy I mean, is But there's amazing. lots of projects. We know this. We know this. There's lots of projects that I'd like to do, and I'm always reliant on other people. I don't know what it was about working with uh, Jane when when she was uh, the lead vocalist for Light Foils. She kind of she's she's so good that she kind of intimidates me, right? Um, and we have this new singer now, Laura, who just I don't know. She's just so much more approachable and I just I really like kind of that male female interaction in vocals when you can get that going uh sure. it's so cool right like you know like if you think about like the slow dive stuff or you know or my you know my buddy Valentine anything where you could just kind of have a back and forth going and and uh, right. I, I I just think that's awesome were you guys in a similar similar situation where you were just kind of um kind of creating your own style with with the limited gear that you had and the limited knowledge you had and you're kind of just trying to take okay I have a delay pedal and a chorus and I'm just sure. I'm trying to make something dreamy but I had no idea about the whammy stuff and the you know the the slow dive you know s guitar synths and you right. know, backwards reverb or I mean I that, that was like science yeah. <laughs> magic you know yeah man I mean so uh, like I mentioned before, like um, I was in this band that didn't have a guitar player. So I had to basically fill all the space. It was me, a drummer and a singer. And um, one of the first things that I, 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 I think I figured it out for myself was that, yeah, getting a delay pedal, you can extend your sound, right? And kind of picked up that, you know, that half uh, cadence, you know, edge kind of doubling, you know, with the delay and stuff like that. Um, and then um, I, I kind of, I picked up this, uh, so at first I was just playing with like one of those, um, I think it was like a boss, like bass station, right? And it had like an EQ and like delay, maybe a chorus on there, right? And it was just like three, like, you know, foot switches all on like one, you know, floor, you know, kind of unit. Uh, sure. And uh, started messing with that, throwing distortion through it, kind of messing with your signal chains. Um, and, you know, it was kind of the thing where we were, it was a combination of not knowing what we were doing and also probably not having a lot of money and experience. So right. you, we did so much improvising, right? And stuff like that. And eventually I kind of got to this rig where I had, a, I found a Digitech TSR-12, which was like a, an onboard reverb unit with a whole bunch of preset effects on it. And I was implementing that and running stereo signals through um, two different amps. So I had like a basement 60 and then this over here and 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 would like do ping pong delays and and oh, wow. kind of uh send stuff back and forth like that and uh you know it just got to i think i was probably at the apex of pedals and stuff maybe when i was doing some of the aerial stuff and then i just started to you know in more recent years have really scaled back on the effects and stuff like that um but yeah, man, I mean, Spacey, shit, we threw everything we could on there, you know? I mean, I had a, an MC303, like, groove box that I would sit there and run through all my effects and stuff like that and, <laughs> and uh, you know, get these big, huge sounds and 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 things like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's, I kind of miss that a little bit, right? Uh, you know, where you're kind of forced to innovate and to think on your feet and improvise. Um, right. And there's something to be said for, you know, like kind of having to do without you know and just just try to create things the best you can without having every you know a thousand pedals in front of you and and all that right. kind of stuff i mean obviously it's nice to to be on the other end of things where you're like i know how to do that and i can you know get all these cool sounds that way too right. um but uh you know yeah man I, I i definitely have a fondness for those garage basement practices you know where mm -hmm. we would be we would be trying to figure out our sound i, I understand what you're saying you know it's uh Back then, you had limited resources, limited knowledge, limited money, but you had the hope and the um, the excitement there of we're going to create something amazing. You know what I yeah. mean? Uh, yeah. And to you, it was. You know what I mean? You're yeah. just like, why doesn't everybody love this? So when you guys are writing songs, are you guys, is it more of like a, a jam at practice? Is someone taking in some ideas or is there a, a like a main songwriter bringing in whole songs? So what's the process like for, I guess, you know, Panda Riot and Light Foils? Like sure. How's yeah, because they're, they're actually two super, super different things. So I'll start with Light Foils. Um, the first EP, uh, the first Light Foils EP, I had basically written parts, everything. And um, for, for a long time, 
um, I would say that I was probably the primary uh, songwriter in Light Foils. Um, we did kind of go he more heavily on jamming stuff out at practice and, oh, that's cool, you know, let's, you know, all right, let's do this and do that. And one thing that I, I've always kind of taken pride in is um, just being able to extract parts out of, you know, stuff that might be a little bit loose and kind of pulling them in together and then, uh, and, and, and arranging and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of being like, all right, that's cool, but chop that, da, 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 da. So, th you know, there's a lot of that in my foils where I've been writing uh, on a, on a DAW called Gadget, which is just basically like synthesizer, you know, like clones basically and, and just kind of doing stuff like that um mm. covid changed things for us um because we weren't practicing for a while uh, and getting together and so i actually finally had something that i could you know garage band and could record stuff at, at my house I, I have not had that for a very very long time which makes no sense i just never made it a priority um <laughs> and uh and neil neil kind of did the same thing he started messing with ableton so the the last couple of uh, cassettes that we've been putting out, this, these, these kind of newer songs with the new lineup, are all songs that were written apart and brought into practice. So Neil wrote 306, I wrote Sunblind, Supervene was Ryan, um, and you know we just get together and kind of put those songs together. Um, Panda Riot, it's you know it's interesting. I uh, when when we started Light Foils. Panda Riot was a band that we were looking at and we were like, man, we want to play with the, it was like one of our goals. We want to play some shows with these guys. You know, we really, I really liked what they were doing and just thought they were cool and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, ended up, um, you know, their bass player wasn't able to carry on. And then they asked me to sit in on a couple of shows and then just asked me to join the band. And one of the things that I kind of stipulated right off the bat was like, look, I be, Light Foils is kind of a, a, a time consuming gig, you know, having kind of more of a leadership role and kind of a primary role in that. So uh, I would really like to just kind of show up and, and play bass uh, in Pandora. So two two really different processes, um, you know, with uh, Light Foils, more of the, the live kind of aspect of bringing it. Uh, and then Pandora is definitely like Brian, Brian and Rebecca, are, you know, working together. And then I just kind of come in and do my thing. Yeah, you had told me years ago something similar about that so yeah but but it's good if you were having to do the same role in both it would kind of be exhausting or why am I even doing both sort right of right I mean sort of. I, I think I've had points in my life before where I was in a couple of bands and had to do more mm -hmm. and it you're, you're right I mean it just it, it just is and you know you know as as you move on in life and you you have your job and your family and those other obligations, you know, time becomes even more precious. Uh, right. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be at a point in my life and in my career um, where I've, you know, kind of put in the work and made the connections and done all that stuff. So it's, it's just easy. I work, you know, everybody that I work with, you know, are pros, you know, so, you know, and that, and that, you know, again, you know, just talking about a different, a different kind of process too, because with uh, Ariel, there were so many songs that, you know, we ended up reworking because it was like, all right, man, yeah, this is, this is cool, but like, let's, let's make it louder, maybe make it slower, you know, kind of, you know, do this. So that's where you get like, kiss me sadly versus kiss me slowly and like you know like um airtight angels man jeremy's like demo version or original version of that is like so different than what we put on crackled and stuff um sure. and that was that was you know just another really cool thing about working with him he's who's really generous about um and open-minded about you know kind of modifying and, and and changing stuff up you know what i mean and so jeremy and i just had like kind of you know you just run into some people that musically you just have a synergy with that mm -hmm. you just you know like it's like they play something and you're like you just jump on it you play something they jump on it and it just fits you know what I mean sure. uh, on, as it turns out in life you know that doesn't always translate to interpersonal relationships and there you know can be tensions and all those kind of things but like you know I, I will to this day he he is one of my favorite people that I ever played with you know like in terms of just like when we would get together and start you know start getting up and jamming and stuff like that that, that we had some really really so, some magical moments and some great shows and uh you know again that's just you know I, why i feel like just tremendously blessed and really lucky to 
know people like you and Chrissy and Preston and, you know, all the bands, you know, like fucking everybody. That's why Crash Pop is always such, and Cal Mishugays are always so fun to be a part of, right? Because it's right. just just the coolest fucking people, man. And you, you, know, you just know them and everybody's just kicking ass, you know, if it's Brief Candles, if it's Tambourina, whoever, you know what I mean? And you're just like, man, I, I'll tell you, man, Sea Shine, dude, uh, uh, this year or at this last Crash Pop, dude, just like, I think they they just killed everybody. They 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 were just so <laughs> just so dynamic and so awesome and just so great. And that that was the cool thing about that show was every band was like, oh shit, you know. So you had to you know you you push you know when you're on a good build, you know th that's always the best kind of shit, right? Because you're kind of pushing each other, right? You you have sure. that oh shit moment, you know. Like I'll tell you, when we were going back and forth with the place to bury strangers, it would be one day they would go on last, the next day we would go on last. You never wanted to go on after those guys, you know, <laughs> or this. I've always liked that that feeling of like, oh man, you know, you see what they just did. We got to go up there and we got to match that or we got to beat that. And it's right. not any kind of like, you know, shitty, like, yeah, you know, kind of like thing like that. It's just, it's just like, you know, it's just friendly, you know, like kind of, you know, both, you know, you know, or even multiple groups just lifting each other up and making the shows sure. good. You know, whenever you get a solid bill, that's that's what it's always about. And that's what I probably miss the most during these last two years is just, you know, the 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 dearth of shows, man, you know, like not being able to get there and, and to have that energy and have that feedback and have those interactions and get to hang out with all the friends, you know, your friends in the crowd and your friends in the bands and all that kind of stuff. And I'm glad to see that slowly coming back. You know what I mean? Like it's, you know, I think, yeah. but this is the first time in, in years, uh, I think, as of calendar year 2021 i'll have played three shows you know right. what i mean man you know i can't wait i can't wait till we get back to some kind of semblance of normal man because it's just you know it's 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 just overdue you know so the last i don't even know maybe eight to ten years um well some could argue even more like boutique pedals and things have become like a huge deal and a lot of these people are aware of shoegaze dream pop or sure. um post whatever yeah. um and they're making effects more towards that as opposed to years ago we were just like oh, here's a boss delay you know yeah like that, that yeah, was yeah. what you had you know um is that something you guys keep up with yeah i mean brian um has uh, a literal wall of pedals and he he's recently got into uh you know making pedals uh so he makes a lot of his own pedals or you know kind of takes schematics from old you know like fuzz pedals and different things from the 60s and 70s and stuff like that and puts those together uh in terms of light foils i mean zishan while he was still in the band probably was the, the the biggest kind of pedal guy um neil keeps it pretty simple um although he did he he got that Strymon uh, Big Sky, which is mm -hmm. uh, just a beautiful, beautiful. That's all over the Chambers uh, record. Um, I think Ryan is is a little bit more kind of utilitarian and kind of minimal in what what he's using in, in terms of that. And myself, I have like really stripped down my sound. You know, it's it's pretty rare that I'll put anything on. You know, maybe a fuzz or you know something occasionally. And sure. I've just kind of found a lot of joy in kind of keeping it low. And you can still be melodic and do co cool stuff, but kind of just keep it you know, keeping it grounded and kind of sinking in with the drums. So that's kind of, that's just kind of how my, my style has evolved. So when you guys are writing songs for each band, are you guys worrying about um, song structures or is it, are you just letting the song kind of take it where it goes? Or are you trying to do like a pop song structure of first chorus, first chorus, some sort of middle, first chorus end, double chorus, whatever. So what's your guys' approach? I mean, I think, I think we're pretty much in that same space. Um, as much as it, as much as it can kind of almost sound like a like a knock, you're like, oh man, you got a pop, you know, pop sound, you know, pop structure. I mean, the the structure exists for a reason. You know what I mean? It it kind of works. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a balanced thing. In most cases, especially uh, if you're like, well, we're gonna you know play some of this shit live. You know, uh, you know, pop structures are. You're, you know, it's helpful. It's helpful to have things that are in that format. You know, in order to put together setlists, right? I mean, you know, yeah, I, I would say that nine times out of ten, uh, the the pop format is what we're gonna you know usually end up doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I mean. I, I every once in a while you get into something that goes goes a different way and stuff like that but yeah i verse chorus verse chorus you know almost always what about because i know for us even if i'm using this pop song structure and it might not even be complicated in any way 
our songs are still always four and a half to five and a half minutes because the tempos are so damn slow and it yeah. drives me nuts because <laughs> ever since vinyl has become big and I could give a shit about vinyl, um, but I have to base my album around what can fit on vinyl. So I have like 20 minutes per side at most, you know what I mean? Well, if your songs are four and a half, five and a half minutes long, you know, you're lucky if you can get four songs on each side. You know what right. I mean? Whereas the CD years, you know, I could put 70 minutes. Uh, that's my album. Now I'm like, yeah. how am I going to possibly fit eight or nine songs on this vinyl? Because the tempos are so slow. Is that yeah, something I mean, you guys have dealt with? I, you know, came up the same way you did, man. You know, it was cassettes first and then CDs. And then, you know, vinyl was not a thing when we were younger. You know what I mean? And it's, it's kind of had this, you know, the big revival. To me, vinyl makes uh, a lot of sense, though, uh, at, because you're getting the most return uh, in terms of sales. You know what I mean? Like you sell a you sell a CD. If, if you have a CD and, and, a, and a vinyl next to each other, you sell the CD for 10 bucks. You can sell that same those same songs on vinyl for like 20, 25 bucks that if you're on the road and you're and you're touring and you're not necessarily playing packed houses everywhere you go uh, sure. can make the difference between breaking even or even coming out a little bit ahead or you know, not, you know what I mean? So sure. um, I, for one, have really come to really appreciate kind of the the, the value proposition that that uh, vinyl presents because it's like, you know, you, you really do get a lot of bang for your buck for that. And that's, it's been kind of a game changer in terms of, um, uh, you know, again, not necessarily putting us ahead financially, but at least it's not killing us. You know what I mean? Or you're, you know, with the last yeah, you couple- you still gotta come up with that three grand. Yeah, make I mean- the vinyl. Yeah. I mean, it's, you gotta, you have to, it's all about, you kind of have to be like an actuary, right? You gotta be like, all right, you know, how many do we press and how, you know, what's our, you know, ROI going to be on that? How, you know, how many can we move? And, you know, all the kind of the, the minutia and stuff that, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're, that's the nice thing about being on a label, right? You know, you don't even have to deal with that shit. You know, that's all up to whoever's putting out the record and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, when you're when you're self-releasing stuff, you, you know, th- those are things that, you, you know, definitely, you know, become factors. But I mean, y- you know, it's 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 a good feeling to to come back off the road and not be like super in the hole. Right. You'd just be like, oh, man, you know, like, cool. You know, like, you know, like I didn't I didn't have to you know, we, we, we made enough for gas. We made enough to cover the van rental, you know, didn't make enough to cover my bar tab. But that's a different story. You know what I mean? Like, uh <laughs> But, uh, you know, in terms of like, oh, we have to put stuff out on vinyl because it's a superior form. I don't, you know, I, I don't get into that shit too much. But like, um, you know, in terms of in terms of, yeah, if you want to like actually, you know, get a little bit of a return on what you're putting out there, it, it's it's kind of hard to ignore, you know, the, the, the value of that, I think. If you've watched any of the episodes, you know that I, I ask people like what their favorite shoegaze dream pop song is or. Another way to say it, if you had to show somebody who's never heard it before, what's a song that you would show them and go, this is what I'm talking about and uh, and why? And then what's a song that you've been a part of that you're most proud of and why? Man, I mean, if you're just if you're trying to explain shoegaze to somebody, I mean, you could you could do worse than like Star Sale, right? Like, you know, just bringing out the verb to kind of be like, look, this is, this is kind of touching a lot of different things, or you could, God, you could play it just, to, there's so many different vibes, man. It's, it's kind of hard to, to just distill it into one song. Obviously you could do soon my bloody Valentine or catch the breeze or fucking, you know, heaven or Las Vegas or something like that. Um, you know, if you really wanted to just be like, Oh, this is, you know, this is kind of, you know, the stuff that's, that's, you know, influential. Right. Pearl by Chapter House, all that kind of stuff. Oh, you, one you know, song because it's okay. going to go on my Spotify playlist. So I'm going to try to pick one then that isn't that people don't typically just pull out of their back pocket to put a little variety in the the playlist. Oh, um, Dream of Bees by Lilies on Mars. It's a cool song. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't hear, didn't see that one coming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and then song that I'm proudest of, hmm, man, um, you know what, let's, let's go back to, let's go back to Tom Spacey, um, end song, um, on Mars is Eden, um, it's a long one, it's like 10 minutes, um, that song, uh, man, uh, it, it started out as two different songs, 
Um, I really like it because, and it also started out with two different lineups. We, we wrote it at first with uh, this guitar player, Billy, and then Daniel joined the band and he threw out most of Billy's parts, but the, the beginning guitar, the ding, 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 you know, like kind of part, um, like is really cool. And we just have that like metronomic delay thing going on. Um, it's a song that I sing uh, and for some, whatever reason, it doesn't bother me to listen to it. <laughs> um, and uh, it's just, it's kind of a, it's a, the song doesn't really mean anything. The lyrics are all just kind of, just kind of more crafted to fit the song, really. It, it, it goes into the big, huge ending. And then it has like a little kind of like D part where we're just doing this just little kind of like rundown um, delay kind of part that we're all kind of pinging back and forth. And then it just ends on the big, you know, big, bass effect you know reverb like kind of you know kind of thing um it we were so good at playing that fucking song that you know and it was and it's a 10 minute fucking song that even if we had a lousy show like or set um that usually brought everybody back in and it was so bombastic and huge and we just really rocked it out so hard um that it you know it just it, i think it, it that it was always kind of a memorable way to finish so that song always you know you know is something that just you know evokes a lot of really cool feelings when I think about it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great that you have that, especially something so early in your, you know, song, song career, if you will. Is there a song that did blow up in some way? And I say blow up, not, you know, we're not right. making millions off of this, but right. it was a song that came out of nowhere and you're like, wow, I totally did not see people latching onto that song. It's funny, um, you know, probably Ariel's biggest song was in, is in your room, at least if you go off of streams, I think it's got a million plays on Spotify. Um, it's, it's a great song, but uh, from a bass perspective, it's like super boring. So mm -hmm. it's interesting because it's like a staple of their set now. But I think back when I was in the band, we 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 hardly played it because we were just like, I was just like, dude, it's it's like I, I can't like it's just it's just no 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 you know like so that that one um, was kind of interesting because we went down to uh, Peru and uh, uh, basically had uh, I think we had an hour and a half to play so we had to basically play everything you know we were just like fuck you know and so we did play in your room and that was probably the song that got the biggest response and I just remember being like man you know like you know, I should probably get over, you know, whatever my <laughs> reservations are about this song, because like people fucking love this song, you know what I mean? But it's just, it's really, it's just three notes. It, it's, it's not a very exciting song to play on bass. What, what carries right. that song is, is Jeremy's vocals, honestly. And the mm -hmm. chorus, the chorus is great, you know? So, but yeah, not, not a fun song to play. So that, that's another one that was kind of like, oh, well, I guess that's a really good song. <laughs> <laughs> You know, probably not my favorite Ariel song, but, uh, you know, definitely, definitely a, a favorite of a lot of people, a beloved song for sure. All right, Corey. Well, thanks for doing the, the interview and, and taking the time to talk to me. And, uh, you know, I appreciate it. And I also am happy that you're watching some of the episodes. So uh, thanks for also agreeing to do it early on, because if you wouldn't have done it and a couple other people wouldn't have agreed to do it, I probably wouldn't have had the, the guts to you know, even try it. So I appreciate oh, it. Oh man. Yeah, no, I mean, I was super stoked uh, when you approached me about it at, the, at first. Uh, and then, you know, you, I seeing everybody that you were talking to, it was, I was like, damn dude, like those guys are doing fuck, you know, like, you know, so <laughs> I mean, I, you know, just kudos, kudos to you, man. Um, and yeah, it's cool. It's cool to, you know, to be a part of the among the clouds family, man, season two bitches, you know, like, you know, like <laughs> season but, two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It actually kind of is since I'm kind of laying low. So, um, but yeah, I, I did kind of feel like it is kind of like going to be a season two, uh, so yeah you're right <laughs> right nice so you heard it here first guys <laughs> yeah anyway all right man so i will talk to you when i talk to you so all thanks. right brother thanks it was a, it was a blast i had a great time i'd like to thank Corey for taking the time to do the show and being a cool friend for all the years uh don't forget to like and subscribe thanks for watching <laughs>